Emily Chang, and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from the week in tech. Coming up, it's been a year since Dell completed its tie-up with EMC. We'll sit down exclusively with Michael Dell and discuss the partnership plus the bigger M&A landscape. Plus, the divide deepens between the president and tech as a growing number of CEOs speak out on DACA. More than 400 business leaders signed a letter on behalf of 800,000 immigrants whose American dreams are now on hold. And Facebook's Russian revelation. The social media giant says it's found political ad spending linked to fake accounts from Russia in the run-up to the U.S. presidential election. But first, to our lead. Dell completed the biggest tech acquisition in history of EMC one year ago, the historic $65 billion deal created the new Dell Technologies, which included the likes of Dell, Dell EMC, VMware, Pivotal, RSA, and SecureWorks. Dell faced several major legal and regulatory hurdles, along with EMC and VMware stockholder skepticism along the way. I sat down with Dell Technologies CEO Michael Dell and asked him for the one-year report card. I'm very pleased with how it's going. The, the reaction from customers and partners has been very strongly positive. Our teams are very engaged. Our customer NPS scores uh, have continued to improve. Our employee engagement scores are record high levels. The revenue synergies are coming bigger and faster than we thought. You know, we're paying down debt at an aggressive pace. And so, you know, a lot of things that could have gone wrong didn't go wrong. and. Uh, I'd say the biggest surprise we've had is we haven't had a lot of surprises. Hmm. And, and certainly you see the success that, uh, you know, VMware is one very important part of, of the Dell Technologies family uh, is enjoying. But across the family, the, the, the business is doing very well. So you mentioned debt. You took on $51 billion in debt. You took on a PC market that has been sluggish. How have you navigated those challenges? Well, we've uh, grown our share in PCs for 18 quarters in a row. I'll, I'll tell you, we're in our 19th quarter in a row mm -hmm. of, of gaining share. You know, I think, look, uh, people have at times questioned the durability of some of our businesses, but they've held up incredibly well, mm -hmm. and we're gaining share. Mm -hmm. And so being able to, to navigate these transitions as we have and bringing the family together, customer partner reaction is very strong. You know, as VMware went out to, uh, uh, you know, get some, some debt to continue its growth and expansion, investment grade ratings from all three rating agencies. So, you know, the Dell Technologies business is, is quite strong. Do you see more consolidation in the industry at large? I mean, we talk a lot about how the big players are already so big and getting bigger. Do you think that will continue? I do. I, 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 and the reason is that customers actually don't want to have a whole bunch of small companies that they work with. Mm -hmm. And there are deep technical reasons why these things should be more integrated. So if you think about what VMware is doing, you know, integrating networking and compute and virtualized storage and how you manage in a software-defined manner, that's very much consistent with what customers want. And it's really about how do you, you know, create a cloud environment, but in an on-premise fashion. Mm -hmm. But how do you stay nimble and make sure you're innovating from within? Or is it about m and it, it, It's not either or. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's both, and it's also the alliances and partnerships mm -hmm. and the venture capital that we deploy in new companies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll invest, you know, four or five, uh, more than $4 billion, <laughs> right, in, in, in R&D uh, across the Dell Technologies family. Where do you see yourselves? in five years? Well, look, what I see from our customers mm -hmm. is that they're engaged in four transformations mm -hmm. simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty exciting time in, in our world. Mm -hmm. The digital transformation. How do you use all this data mm -hmm. that's being created with all these smart, intelligent sensors and nodes that are being created, the explosion in connected devices and this new age of human-machine interaction? That is a a CEO board level agenda item mm -hmm. in every company that we deal with, mm -hmm. okay? So that's the first one, the digital transformation. Then you have the IT transformation. Mm -hmm. How do I become more cloud-like, more software-defined? How do I modernize and automate my infrastructure to run that super efficiently in many ways so I can fund the digital transformation? Mm -hmm. Then you have the workforce transformation. Mm -hmm. How do I make sure that 
the people inside the company mm -hmm. have the right tools so they can be productive and efficient, and it's not about giving them the lowest cost thing possible, mm -hmm. but you know, I want to attract and retain the high quality workforce I have. Mm -hmm. People are figuring out productivity matters and the devices are important. And then the next one is, uh, the last one is security. Mm -hmm. The attack surface is getting much greater, and we have a broad set of capabilities to help our customers defend and protect their most critical information uh, and data. And look, business is about trust and assurance. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the, the sophisticated nature of the attacks is only increasing, and that's an incredibly important topic for our customers. So we're focused on those four big transformations. We think we're unique in the set of capa capabilities we bring across the whole uh, spectrum, and that makes us highly relevant for customers. And that's why you know we're growing faster than the overall industry. Our exclusive conversation with Michael Dell there. And later this hour, we bring you more from the conversation, including Dell's strategy for fighting off the competition. Well, Amazon is planning to build its first fulfillment center in New York. It'll be located in Staten Island and create more than 2,200 full-time jobs. The new center is part of an ongoing push by the e-commerce giant to house inventory closer to customers and enable fast deliveries. The company says employees will have the opportunity to work with advanced robotics. And Amazon has begun the search for a second headquarters in North America. The world's largest online retailer plans to send more than $5 billion and add as many as 50,000 jobs. Coming up, was Russian money being funneled to produce political ads on Facebook? We look at what the social media giant has discovered next. Plus, GoPro is giving an optimistic outlook after a push to cut expenses and update its product line. We'll hear how it pulled off a comeback in the crowded space of action cameras and drones. This is Bloomberg. Facebook says it's been investigating possible connections between ads purchased on its site and Russia. The social media giant says it discovered about $100,000 in ad spend connected to about 470 accounts likely run out of Russia. This would suggest that Russian money was used in violation of U.S. laws that prohibit advertisements to be bought from overseas to influence American elections. Most of those ads were bought between June of 2016 and May of this year. Facebook says it's deleted the accounts and pages and is providing details to U.S. election investigators. We covered this topic with our Bloomberg Tech reporter, Sarah Fry. Facebook has been looking into what it calls information campaigns, which are, they sort of have this malicious fake uh, element to them where there are a lot of fake accounts, a lot of fake pages, and they try to uh, spread propaganda in one way or the other. They had a report come out earlier this year that detailed that and, and linked it sort of vaguely to Russia. This now comes out and says money is involved. And while $100,000 might not sound like a lot of money, right it can buy a lot in Facebook advertising. This is more than 3,000 ads that were purchased uh, that were targeted in some cases to certain geographic regions, which we know was very important ahead of an election. Um, while most of the ads didn't name a candidate or talk specifically about voting, they did talk about very divisive issues in the US. Like, like, like LGBT rights and gun rights and race relations and immigration so so they were trying to spark or whoever was behind this effort um, whether it was the government or some other Russian actor was trying to spark some divisiveness in America ahead of the election. Now I know that they're sharing information with US regulators but is there any idea just who in Russia was behind the ads? I mean is, is there any clarity on whether they have ties to the actual Russian government? Facebook is not saying whether they have ties to the government. Of course, we are looking into it. Everyone is looking into it. Um, there are several uh, intelligence committee uh, ongoing uh, investigations into this. So, so I think I think that uh, Facebook is cooperating. They're trying to provide information where they can. But the main thing they're trying to do is prevent this from happening in the future. They're looking at the patterns, matching it to uh, you know, their machine learning algorithms and trying to stop this from being a problem in future elections around the world. 
Bloomberg's Sarah Fryer there. And Facebook is said to be offering hundreds of millions of dollars to major record labels and publishers for music rights. In exchange, users would be allowed to include songs in videos they upload. According to people familiar with the matter, Facebook has currently agreed to set up a system for tagging videos that infringe copyrights. But that system could take up to two years to establish. James Chalkmock, analyst at Monus Crespi and Hart, and our Bloomberg News reporter Lucas Shaw gave their reaction. Facebook and the music industry have spent months trying to figure out how to resolve this ongoing problem where you have millions of videos getting uploaded to Facebook that have music that can't be there. Uh, so Facebook is trying to build a system kind of like what YouTube uses, which YouTube calls Content ID. But because that'll take so long, in the meantime, Facebook would give a bunch of different rights holders millions of dollars, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, to basically buy them off while they build this system, supposedly in collaboration with these music partners, to have a system for all the user-generated videos that you see and are so familiar with already. So James, this comes as Facebook is rolling out a new hub for video called Watch. What do you make of this? I think it's great. I think it's super smart. And the thing is, they had the leverage right now so they can likely get the deal done. And if you think about it, what they're doing is putting their money where their mouth is and actually willing to spend a ton of money in order to keep people engaged. You know, whether it's ensuring that there's no issues when it comes to music, because that's one of the primary use cases of uploading videos for user-generated content. Um, and that you know millennials like to do but at the same time they're willing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on top of that for video content like they bid 600 million for the Indian Premier League uh, on cricket so I think what they're showing is that their willingness to to really be a contender and a real player uh, when it comes to the the digital content arena Lucas who does this put pressure on YouTube who else the, the record industry certainly hopes YouTube. I mean, they've been trying to get YouTube to change the way it behaves for years, really with no success, because to, to James's point, they have no leverage. Uh, so so they're, they're hoping there. And, and also, it does put some pressure on Facebook to figure it out. I mean, I think they're hoping that you know, the tighter they get bound together, uh, the, the more Facebook, the more seriously Facebook will, will take these problems. But it doesn't necessarily put pressure on anyone in the long term. You know, th this is really just the next step in Facebook figuring out what its, what its video strategy is. So on that note, James, Facebook also made a bid for India's mm -hmm. Premier League cricket right. games. They lost. Um, however, they also bid for NFL Thursday night sure. football games. They lost to Amazon. What do you make of it? It's, they're, they're very much dabbling here, it seems. They're dabbling, but making, you know, 100 plus million dollar bids, you know, for this kind of content. And at the end of the day, I think if on a head to head matchup, Amazon uh, versus Facebook, it's advantage Amazon. Uh, because, you know, investors are conditioned to a 0% margin, you know, so there's un virtually unlimited amount of cash they can spend. But uh, Facebook, I think, uh, willing to show the willingness, I think, is impressive in and of itself. I think the one thing that Facebook needs to be careful of is not uh, trying to monetize some of their newer emerging efforts like the WhatsApp and Messengers of the World too fast and make sure they get the experiences right. Okay, let's talk about that because we're just starting to see how they will potentially be earning yeah. money from WhatsApp. They're developing some new features. They're going to charge businesses uh, to use those features to communicate with consumers. Uh, what do you make of that? I think it's the right thing to By do. By the way, they I spent $20 <laughs> billion dollars on WhatsApp, we should point out. Yeah, well, it's the right thing to do. I just don't want them to rush it because they did it, executed so perfectly with Facebook, so perfectly with Instagram. Uh, and right now, people are still using uh, uh, Messenger and WhatsApp, but I'm not sure they're ready for the kind of in-app uh, type of uh, advertisements and and yes it's great to monetize the business relationships I just it's been a few years though it's been a few years but they're also facing pressure right now with the declining ad load so they're going to need to show growth and I just hope that it's not being done um, as a reactive measure uh, to the market expectations versus actually turning on the spigots for monetization at the right time when it comes to Twitter and snapchat at this yeah. point I mean do they, we know growth is, is struggling at both those companies. Do they stand a chance? I think Twitter does have a chance uh, as long as they deploy the right strategy because Twitter is a service that I think is indispensable when mm. it comes to real-time information. We use it every site, every website um, and uh, media outlet, you know, um, 
uh, references it. Uh, with Snap, I think that every day is going to get harder and harder. And you know, we came out initially bullish on Snap, but I think they're, they're their worst enemy because they're not capitalizing on their core strengths. And in the meantime, you have Facebook showing the willingness to spend money on content. And if they start to win that battle, it's a losing one for proposition well, for Snap. Lucas, when it comes to content, obviously when, when you're bidding for rights to a specific franchise, it is a zero-sum game. But more broadly, is it a zero-sum game? Can Facebook and Amazon and YouTube, can they all win there if they're willing to pay up? The tech companies could all win. The question is, is the ecosystem big enough, not just for them, but for the media guys that already have the rights? I mean, what we've seen in the NFL, Twitter had the NFL last year, but most people still watch those games on CBS and NBC. There were, the audiences on smaller were much, Twitter, were, excuse me, on Twitter were much smaller. What we'll see with Amazon this year is, can Amazon pull some of those viewers away? And you know how seriously are Facebook, Amazon, Twitter going to bid on some of these rights? You know, I, I, I was really surprised by the Facebook bid for the cricket rights, just because Facebook executives have in the past indicated that they didn't want to spend a ton of money on rights. They were hoping to just work out scenarios where they could share advertising revenue. Uh, that suggests that they're willing to spend enough money to try to bi buy away some of the biggest rights out there. And when that happens, we're, we could see a more significant migration of viewers from TV to these newer platforms. That was Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw and James Chalkmock with Monas Crespi and Hart. Well, it is a partial victory for Intel in its eight-year battle with the European Union over a $1.26 billion regulatory fine. The EU's top court ruled that a lower court has to re-examine Intel's appeal in the antitrust case. Intel is among the few companies to have continued a lengthy battle against a European Commission fine all the way to the top EU court. The matter could have ramifications for disputes involving U.S. tech companies like Google and Apple. Coming up, after several quarters of struggling with its bottom line, GoPro is inching towards profitability. We'll hear from its chief operating officer next. Plus, leaders in the tech industry last out against President Trump's decision to end a program preventing the deportation of immigrants legally brought to the U.S. as children. We'll do a deep dive on the controversial decision. This is Bloomberg. Google is looking to resurrect its Android One smartphone program in India. The Alphabet company teaming up with Xiaomi to market the Chinese smartphone maker's Mi A1 phone in one of the world's largest emerging markets. Google first launched the Android One project in India three years ago to sell affordable smartphones there, but sales were lacking. The phone went on sale Tuesday for $234 and has a 5.5 inch 1080p screen with a dual camera system. While well, GoPro has been living on the edge the last couple of quarters, facing shrinking consumer demand, the company has seen sales plummet. But the action camera and drone maker says it's on the road to profitability. Bloomberg's Selena Wang spoke to GoPro Chief Operating Officer CJ Prober about the company's turnaround efforts. You know, one of the things that wasn't mentioned in the preamble and one of the things that we're most excited about uh, about our Q3 announcement is that we're actually going to be profitable on an on-gap basis in Q3 which is a big development, in addition to the high end of the range on the revenue and the high end of, of the range on the margin. And really what's driving that is quite simple. Uh, the Hero 5 is the best product um, we've ever launched, um, and we're seeing really strong demand for it. Uh, in addition to um, you know, the differentiation that we've enabled through Hero 5 in terms of voice control, waterproof with no housing, uh, cloud connected. We now have a really amazing software ecosystem, which is super differentiated, and that uh, it allows consumers to move their content from their cameras to their phone automatically. We create a, uh, a, a video for the consumer automatically, and then they can tweak it to their heart's delight, or they can share it directly. And so okay. that experience okay, so is called- Okay, have been talking about making the camera, the hardware, and the software easier to use, assuming you're trying to target a broader base of consumers. But the fundamental question remains, what is a value proposition to the average consumer that's perfectly happy with the camera on these ever-improving smartphones? Yeah. 
If you look at the movement that's happening on platforms like Instagram and WeChat, and the amount of content creation that's happening, and if you look at the tip of the spear consumer on those platforms, the, the, the phone doesn't um, enable sufficient versatility, sufficient immersive capture. And so what we're really trying to do with GoPro is to free our consumers from, um, from the capture experience and let them live the moment, live the activity, capture that activity. And then on the other side of it, on the software side, we want the experience of sharing that content to be as easy as if you captured on the phone. So we're really freeing our consumers from, uh, from capturing in the moment to living that moment and enjoying it and then having the same convenience that you have today with your phone. GoPro is projecting return to non-GAAP profitability in Q3. Are we, should we expect to see a sustained return to profitability beyond the end of the year? And if so, how are you going to achieve that? Yeah. So uh, we set a stretch goal at the beginning of the year to be profitable on an on-gap basis for all of 2017, uh, and we expect to achieve that. We also expect to achieve double-digit revenue growth this year. Um, and as it relates to next year, uh, we do expect to be profitable and more profitable in 2018. And the reason for that is we implemented a number of cost measures um, in March of this year, and it took several uh, months to get those costs out of the system. So we're gonna have the full year benefit of those cost savings next year with increased, uh, with, with continued revenue growth, lower OPEX. We also expect to expand margins with the roadmap that we have. So we're expecting to deliver even better profitability in 2018. The company is announcing positive news today, but the shares are still down almost a third over the year, and there are mostly sell and neutral ratings on the stock. So what are investors missing here? Yeah. You know, I've been through a turnaround situation like this before, and the stock price always lags performance. We don't focus too much on um, the stock. It's our job to deliver amazing products for consumers. It's our job to deliver an amazing work environment for our employees, and it's our job to deliver against the expectations we set for our uh, investors. And over the first quarter, the second quarter, and now the third quarter, um, in addition to meeting expectations for consumers and meeting expectations for employees, we're meeting expectations for our investors. So in a turnaround like this, it takes time for the, the, the stock and investors to follow, but we're confident that we're gonna to continue to execute and that that will come over time. Now, CJ, really quickly, you are at the City uh, Global Tech Conference right now. What are the conversations like with investors? How is this different from previous years? It's really quite different from 12 months ago. Um, there's a recognition that GoPro has a very sound um, foundational business. And as we share our vision for the future and how GoPro can become this extension of the smartphone, an untethered lens to the smartphone, the discussion is really how big can that opportunity be? How, how much of the Instagram content share, the WeChat content share can GoPro capture? So the, 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 fun, the discussion is fundamentally shifted from is the business sound to yes, our core business is sound and profitable and growing. And now it's how big is the opportunity ahead of us? GoPro COO CJ Prober there speaking with Bloomberg Selena Wang. Coming up, CEOs blasted President Trump this week over his decision to end DACA. We will hear from the head of one startup speaking out next. And a reminder, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. After months of speculation and mixed messages, the Trump administration made it official. The Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, better known as DACA, is ending. President Trump explained the decision. I have a great heart for the folks we're talking about, a great love for them. And people think in terms of children, but they're really young adults. Uh, I have a love for these people, and hopefully now Congress will be able to help them and do it properly. And I can tell you, in speaking to members of Congress, they want to be able to do something and do it right. 
The program allows people who entered the U.S. illegally as children to apply for renewable two-year permits that shield them from deportation. Those who fall into this category are known as dreamers. Tech reaction to the repeal was swift, with leaders quick to offer their take. Apple CEO Tim Cook tweeted, Dreamers contribute to our companies and our communities just as much as you and I. Apple will fight for them to be treated as equals. Google CEO Sundar Pichai also tweeted, Dreamers are our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers. This is their home. Congress needs to act now to defend DACA with Dreamers. Other tech giants like Microsoft have said they intend to take legal action if their employees, who happen to be dreamers, are deported and will fund their employees' legal bills if necessary. Alex Corasta, Cato Institute's immigration policy analyst and Bloomberg News reporter Bill Ferries, joined from Washington to discuss. It really puts uh, the employees in particular in a, in a state of legal limbo. What President Trump and uh, Attorney General Sessions said today is that they want to kick this over to Congress, give them about six months to pass legislation that uh, could, in theory, make, uh, make uh, these people have a full legal status, just like they've had uh, under the DREAM Act or, or in some other capacity. Um, the reality is immigration reform has been a real hard uh, sell in Congress for several years, and Congress has a ton on its plate already when you think about the debt limit and Hurricane Harvey and passing a budget and all those things. It's probably not something they were looking for, and a lot uh, it, it adds to a very full plate over the next six months. Now, Alex, uh, President Obama did make a statement today. He said to target these people is wrong because they have done nothing wrong. It is self-defeating. It is cruel. Let's be clear. The action taken today isn't required legally. It is a political decision and a moral question. Talk to us about that. Is this a moral question and I not a legal issue? Well, there's certainly, uh, I think it can be both. I mean, there are moral issues here as well as legal ones. But in terms of the moral dimension, you have people who are brought here as children under the age of 16 uh, or 16 or younger. They, were not, they did not make the decision themselves to come to the United States and break our immigration laws. Many of them in, their ca in these cases have grown up here. Many of them didn't know they were illegal immigrants until they were older. This is the only country that they know. They are educationally and culturally American. That's why over 80 percent, about 80 percent of Americans Americans have sympathy for them and want to give them at least um, the ability to stay or a path to citizenship. So these are people that we can have a lot of sympathy for and generally we don't like to punish people for the crimes of their parents. And this is one of these cases where the American public I think is completely in, uh, on the right side of this ethically notwithstanding any of the legal issues. Now uh, President Trump bill is saying that now it's time for Congress to pass, you know, comprehensive immigration reform, but will he actually support it? Well, he, you know, the uh, the language used today was very interesting. Uh, President Trump has kind of publicly agonized over this decision, even though during the campaign he said it was something he would uh, he would do on his first day in office. Uh, but the language you heard, particularly from Attorney General Jeff Sessions, was much harsher. He uh, he really described uh, people who have benefited under the Dream Act uh, as illegal aliens. He said uh, they have been taking jobs away from uh, true citizens. Uh, that kind of terminology doesn't sound uh, to most people's ears very compassionate, and it does raise the question of uh, how much support he'll put behind uh, any congressional effort to uh, to enact this legislatively. And one of the and one of the important points, by the way, if if I may, just real quick, Senator uh, Attorney General Sessions said that any kind of legalization of the Dreamers should probably be teamed up with other legislative proposals that the uh, president wants, such as the Rays Act, which was a bill introduced that would cut legal immigration in half, including cut skilled immigration by about 100,000 a year once it goes into effect. And that's just a non-starter. That's done on arrival. So if Congress is serious about passing a dream act to legalize these people, they need to really ignore the advice, the political advice of the attorney general and instead put up a clean dream act without any other kind of features or anything unpopular like the Rays Act, which will make it impossible to pass. And of course, uh, Mitch McConnell already weighing in on this. Let's take in a listen to what he had to say earlier. All right, Senator Mitch McConnell, well, he said President Obama wrongly believed he had the authority to rewrite our immigration law. Today's action by President Trump corrects that fundamental mistake. Uh, this Congress will continue working on securing our border and ensuring a lawful system of immigration that 
works. So, Bill, what's next? You know, uh, Congress is just getting back into town tonight. This was not the uh, welcome present they were really looking for. Uh, on the immediate horizon, it's hard to see something getting done in the next few weeks. Congress has to pass an increase in the debt limit. They have to look at passing some sort of a budget or continuing resolution just to fund the government, either through the end of the year or through the next fiscal year. Uh, and you have Hurricane Harvey aid, and that's going to be tied into all of that. So I imagine you're going to have different proposals coming up from bipartisan groups of, uh, of senators and, uh, and members of the House. Um, but I don't think we're going to get a real, real clear guidance on whether this is possible for quite a while. All right. Nancy Pelosi has just been speaking with reporters, and she mentioned that uh, attaching, she doesn't think attaching DACA to the debt ceiling is a reality. Um, Alex, tell me a little bit more about what you expect when it comes to the actual legal fight that these people and companies that employ them might now end up involved in. So it's going to be a very vicious legal fight. We already heard about a lot of the tech firms that are going to be defending their employees uh, who are on DACA. But this also speaks to a wider problem. A lot of these firms have large numbers of foreign-born workers on their workforces, either on employment-based green cards or other visas. And I think they feel like they need to defend the dreamers, especially to show the rest of their employees and investors that they're serious about protecting their very skilled workforce. Now, we have a six-month deadline when, in early March 2018, the president's cancellation of DACA will start pushing a thousand dreamers a month off of their work permits and into the illegal economy, whether they'll either be fired from their jobs immediately or they will have to work illegally in the black market, just like another, uh, the other about 10 to 11 million illegal immigrants who are in this country. We are on a deadline here to be able to solve this. this is not a soft deadline. And Congress, this is one of the more pressing issues. This is more important than a lot of the other ones they've been talking about. This is something where there's broad agreement across the political spectrum with moderates, with conservatives, and with a lot of liberals that something needs to be done to legalize these people and to bring them out of the shadows so that they can work lawfully in the United States. It's good for the economy, it's good for us ethically, and it's consistent with our traditions in this country. So we need to get on this, and I think Congress needs to get on it and try to solve this problem immediately, because it's very rare that Congress actually passes a reform in an election year uh, of this magnitude. So they really have uh, three to four months to be able to figure it out before it becomes politically more desperate and toxic. Mm -hmm. Alex Norasta from the Cato Institute and Bloomberg News reporter Bill Ferry is there. Well, President Trump's decision on DACA was met with swift disavowment from the tech community. The rebuke from tech comes as no surprise, as 60% of the most highly valued tech companies in the U.S. have first or second generation immigrant founders. And 13 of those top tech companies are collectively worth over $3 trillion, employed more than one and a half million people last year. Turo CEO Andre Haddad joined us to give his opinion on the decision. Haddad recently published a post titled Immigrant as Innovator, detailing the U.S. immigration dilemma and his journey after fleeing his native Lebanon due to civil war. You fled Lebanon when you were 17 years old. I know this is a very personal issue for you. You know, what is your reaction to what the White House has done? To be honest with you, I'm very disappointed. Mm. Uh, I've always uh, had this uh, belief that what makes the U.S. a very special place is that it's a place where people who are immigrants and refugees who are seeking a better future can find their home. And I think that that's been uh, the moral of the U.S. for you know generations. And it's also been part of the economic success of the U.S. I think our ability to attract you know talented people who are fleeing and are deciding themselves to seek a better future somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, exactly the sort of people that share that DNA with the entrepreneur who is seeking a better future, who sees opportunities somewhere and builds a company, pursues you know, that better future. And uh, I think that's part of the economic success story of the U.S. So the president is saying that's all great, but U.S. workers, U.S. jobs need to come first and that immigrants are taking jobs from American workers. You know, what do you have to say to that as someone who, you know, employs uh, many immigrant workers? I think that's a fallacy. I mean, when you look at the uh, data that you mentioned earlier in your opening remarks, a lot of these immigrants that have been brought to the U.S. have created a lot of value. So I'm sure that it's not you know, a zero-sum game. You know, I think there's a lot of value that's created by these immigrants. They're building companies. They're employing a lot of U.S. workers. The economy is not just about one job is taken by another job. It's what's the total value creation that talent brings to the country. 
speaking of the value that you have created, you just raised $92 million. Turo uh, is a car sharing company. I, I want to start by having you tell us a little bit how, how it works and how it differs from other, you know, rental car companies out there like, say, Getaround or Zipcar mm -hmm. um, and the ride sharing business, whether that's Uber or Lyft. Yes, thank you for uh, giving me that opportunity. I think Turo is a very much a, uh, an Airbnb for cars. So we're an open marketplace. Uh, we don't actually control our fleet. We enable people to list their cars and share them on the platform. And we have more than 800 makes and models today, everything from you know, Mercedes-Benz to a Tesla to a smart car, you know, and everything in the middle. So it's very diverse. Uh, there's lots of offers. We have uh, just celebrated our 4 millionth user and 170,000 cars that are listed on the platform. And uh, we're very much focused on enabling people to take long duration trips with these cars. And so we're offering rentals by the day minimum. And most uh, our travelers, our customers are booking cars by the week or weekends or several days. The average is four days. And on the other hand, we enable our uh, hosts who are sharing their cars to really turn the car from a kind of cost center that depreciates over time mm -hmm. into a revenue generating asset. And so that's one of the things that make us really unique compared to a traditional car rental business like Zipcar. So if you live in an area that is well served by Uber and Lyft, mm -hmm. you know, why rent a car instead? Well, ride sharing versus car sharing. Ride sharing and car sharing actually coexist really well. In fact, we see that our most uh, loyal customers at Turo are people who have uh, downsized on their ownership and may be using more frequently than average ride sharing services like Lyft or Uber. Mm -hmm. What happens is, you know, Lyft and Uber can be very practical for your uh, weekly commute needs or for simple transportation needs from A to B. But if you want to get out of town for the weekend, if you want to go on a trip uh, for several days, if you want to go to a place that's uh, uh, you know, maybe special where you want to have a nice driving experience, then you can actually rent your neighbor's car. So we're particularly practical for people who live in you know, city centers and who may not own a vehicle anymore, uh, and we become the preferred way for them to get out of town for the weekend. Uber and Airbnb have, are still dealing with a lot of regulatory issues. What kind of regulatory issues are you dealing with? Our biggest regulatory challenges are around insurance. Uh, you know, insurance is part of the uh, Turo model. Uh, we provide coverage through our partner, Liberty Mutual, who also joined our fundraise uh, for our Series D. We're delighted about that. Uh, we provide the insurance that covers both the host and the guest. And of course, insurance is a highly regulated industry. Uh, and you know, this notion of renting out your car and making money with your car is something that predates a lot of the car insurance laws. So we're trying to help you know, the insurance ecosystem move forward and embrace this notion that the car is an asset that can be rented out and earn money for its owner. So when you look at the future of car transportation, let's say 10 years from now, how much of it is ride sharing? How much of it is car sharing? How much of it is traditional car ownership? How much of it is self-driving cars? Because your businesses, you know, could change dramatically just over the course of a decade, right? Given yes. all of the technological shifts happening right now. Absolutely. We think that a big part of the future of uh, the evolution of cars and transportation is going to be a bit of a mix of all the above. You know, 10 years from now when, you know, level five autonomy will be uh, more close to reality than what it is today, we think that autonomous vehicles are going to be amazing to share because it's so easy to be able to you know, summon your car and have it go meet your guests and pick them up from their hotel and to have them drive your car for a day or for you know, a weekend. And uh, that just makes sharing of your car a lot easier. And we think that that future of autonomous cars is going to make sharing you know, as convenient as just hailing a car today. Turo CEO Andre Haddad there. U.S. lawmakers passed a bill to speed up the introduction of self-driving cars. The House bill will put the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in charge of regulating self-driving car safety and preempt competing rules at the state level. This means manufacturers would eventually be able to introduce as many as 100,000 self-driving cars per year. The bill now moves to the Senate, where a bipartisan trio of senators are already working on their own competing piece of legislation. Well, coming up, more from our exclusive conversation with Michael Dell. His thoughts on how the company fights off its rivals next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg.
Foxconn is teaming up with Apple, SoftBank, and Sharp in an effort to buy Toshiba's memory chip division. While the value of the bid wasn't disclosed, it would give Foxconn a 25% stake, while Apple, Sharp, and SoftBank would hold a smaller percentage. The group is competing with two separate deals from Bain Capital and KKR, each said to be about $19 billion. Toshiba needs to raise the money by March to repair its balance sheet and avoid being delisted from the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Well, the massive Dell EMC merger is based on an ethos of bigger is better. And since that deal was finalized a year ago, CEO Michael Dell has assembled a massive company to help push back against the rising demand for cloud providers like Amazon and Microsoft. It's investing in new products and partnerships to woo dollars away from the encroaching rivals while also keeping traditional competitors at bay. In my exclusive interview, I asked Michael Dell about the strategy and if it is his goal to be the last and largest company left standing. I think if you look at what's going on in, in the world, IT is actually shifting to BT, business technology, mm -hmm. where you can't actually do anything without technology. Mm -hmm. You can't sell anything, mm -hmm. you can't buy anything, you can't make anything, you can't have customer relationships. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and this is true across organizations of all sizes and government and society. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I actually see the overall market when you consider the role technology is playing getting much larger. So when I go visit the largest industrial companies or the automotive companies, manufacturing, retail, they're thinking about how they use data in a very different way. Applications are very important, but ultimately it's the data that drives a, a business. And when you start to layer on these you know, next generation computer science, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning, you know, data is the fuel for that. We store more than half of the mission critical data in the world. And the amount of data is, is going to grow much, much more in the next 30 years than it has in the last 30 years. It's doubling at a faster and faster pace uh, because of all these connected nodes. Now, you're not fully private. VMware is still a public company. What's the long-term plan? Will you go fully private? Will you ever go public again? We don't have any plans to change our structure. We're very happy with our privately controlled structure. You know, we have two public companies in the group, and uh, you know, it's it's working quite well. So we talked about M&A earlier. You said you were going to do a lot of M&A, but it's been fairly quiet. Why is that? Is it valuations? Are you not seeing anything you like out there? We've done some M&A mm -hmm. inside VMware, uh, done a little bit in Dell EMC, and look, we'll continue to explore M&A. Our Dell Technologies Capital Group is you know, investing about in about one company a week in, in new businesses that we're finding that are out 36, 48 months mm -hmm. in a, in, into the future working on new things. There's also, a, a, I'd say, a wicked consolidation going on in the existing parts of IT and we're using our supply chain, our scale, our breadth, the portfolio effect, and innovation to, to drive that and gaining share in, in, that, in, in that core as well. So would you be more likely to invest in hardware or services at this point when it comes to M&A? If you look at the things we're investing in, it's artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, next generation processor architectures, to enable those new computing models. It's cloud security, you know, app, uh, how do you enable the cloud native apps, those, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, we're, we're pretty good at, at, at hardware, right? And, and uh, we're gonna continue to grind away at making that more and more efficient so co companies can run their infrastructure in a, in a super efficient manner. And look, we've got a massive innovation engine internally mm -hmm. and with our partners uh, to, to, to you know, help, help make sure we continue to gain share. So when you look at the competitive landscape, who can challenge Dell more than it has? There's no shortage of competitors. I mean, we, I, I, we happen to be doing well relative to our competitors. You know, I think the, the, the best way for us to plot our future is really to listen to our customers. You know, if we're going around following our competitors, that's not really a great strategy. HPE, is it still the rival it once was? 
you know they're 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 not doing so hot these days, and and uh, you know that's a that's a better question for them. But I mean, we're we're clearly gaining share, and they're clearly losing share. And some of it is this portfolio effect. I think our innovation engine is is on high. We've passed them in in servers. We're far bigger than they are in storage, and uh, you know look, customers ultimately will vote with their feet and their dollars, and they're they're voting for Dell Technologies. Our conversation there, exclusive with Michael Dell. Coming up, Pokemon Go was a global phenomenon last year, and the company has big plans to keep its fervent fans. Our exclusive interview with the CEO of Pokemon next. This is Bloomberg. After more than a year since its launch, Pokemon Go still attracts more than 65 million people around the world. In the U.S. alone, the game has been among the 20 most lucrative apps this year. Speaking to Bloomberg's Yuji Nakamura, Pokemon CEO Sunekazu Ishihara hints at big plans for the game. When we launched Pokemon Go last year, it was only 10% of what Niantic and us wanted to achieve. We are still working on creating the ability to swap Pokemons or have the users battle their peers. We've only covered 140 Pokemon so far. With more than 800 figures, there's still much more we can come up with. Hishara-san, uh, I just wanted to ask you, the Switch has been out now for half a year. Uh, what are your impressions of how it's doing and uh, what were your impressions before it went out? Has anything changed? I told Nintendo that Switch wouldn't be a success before it went on sale, because I thought that, in the age of the smartphone, no one would carry around a game console. It's obvious I was wrong. I came to realize the key to a successful game is quite simple. Software with absolute quality leads sales of hardware. Playing style can be flexible if the software is attractive enough. Currently, it's popular among the early adapters, and there needs to be one more step to attract a wider audience. I see more potential in Switch, but one shouldn't overestimate its potential. You know, you mentioned uh, strong software is uh, the key to a system. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about your upcoming game for the Switch, your Pokemon game for the Switch. It caused a lot of excitement when it was announced in June. Uh, what else can you tell me about it? The Pokemon games work well on handheld devices, and we are developing games that work on Switch. I can't give you details on what we are working on at this stage, but for now, we would like everyone to focus on Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, due in November, and Pokin Deluxe on Switch, due on September 22nd. We are currently focused on providing different playing styles to our customers. Pokemon Go CEO Sunikazu Ishihara there. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Tune in each day, 5 p.m. New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.